So we put him on fluids and he perked up quite a bit. Then he took a turn for the worst. 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 Which is it, turn for the worst? I never know. Emily Martin, shut up. You're like famous. Emily's got over 20 million views on YouTube. Oh my God. Honestly, it's too stupid to talk about. You have really low self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I moved from Austin about two years ago. It's my ex, I'm sorry. Is everything okay? Oh no. Hi, I'm here to see a patient, Mr. Roosevelt. It's kidney failure. <clears throat> Hello. This is Celeste. It's my girlfriend. Where are you staying? The house looks amazing. Tea time. Why didn't you tell me about Celeste? We haven't spoken since you broke up with me over the phone. <laughs> so, after you're staying with your ex-boyfriend, his new girlfriend. Emily. Did I wake you? Yes. She is super, super nice and put together and everything in her life is beautiful and nothing's out of place. You know, like a Pinterest board come to life. Eric, how's your band going? Eric's taking a break from music right now. He's getting his real estate license. I love houses. How could you let her do this to me? She's trying to make me look bad. Celeste has been nothing but nice to you. Okay. You win. You got the guy. You got the house. You just feel guilty for leaving him. <laughs> I just had all these plans and these goals. Just breathe. How am I supposed to breathe? You just threw water my... Oh, my God! This is the part where you're supposed to start laughing. What? You wanna see my gun? Oh. You're not quirky, but you're definitely kind of a bitch. Emily, you suck. One, two, three, say Mr. Roosevelt. Mr. Roosevelt! Maybe you've had too much to drink. Mm. You think? Hey everybody, please welcome writer, director, star of Mr. Roosevelt, Noah Wells. Let's hear it. Yeah. Let's go back to the beginning. I, you know, yeah. directing a film is no small feat. And it's one of those things that we have them on all the time. And the first film is really, I think, probably the hardest to get off the ground and to sort of realize that you can do it. Yeah. So how did that happen for you? I mean, it took a long time to get to this point. Um, I've been making my own projects uh, since I was in college and even before that. Um, I had done a lot of character work. I've done a lot of sketches, like seeing things from the very beginning um, all the way through to editing and then putting it online. And so um, really, this is just a matter of writing something that's longer and then <laughs> <laughs> uh, which took a long time to actually be able to write a script that I felt would be a complete film, specifically because it started out as such a character character piece. I'm, I had a, a version of the emotional journey I wanted this character to go on, but, uh, you know, it's an indie film and you kind of want it, I wanted it to feel like a movie, no matter what budget level I ended up getting to make it at. Um, so that's Mr. Roosevelt. It took a long time to get to that point, but now we're here and it's about to come out into the world. How long did it take you to write it? Um, well, I think the, the true answer is I've been writing her since college. Um, I've been writing scenes for her. And for the character. For the character, played, yeah. yeah, Emily, um, who is this, I don't know, a millennial type person that we all recognize and you might recognize parts of her in yourselves and um, she's obnoxious and self-absorbed, self but um, fundamentally like good at, at the core, she just needs to grow up. Um, so if you're taking that into account, it would be maybe seven years, but honestly, I didn't really try to finish it <laughs> until the past couple of years. Now you're, you are as well an actress and you know, you edit and you know, you, yeah. you, you write as well and you're doing comedy and she is all of those things yeah. as well. What made you want to inject so much of who you are into who she is? I've always been writing from sort of experiences that I've had, that I've had. So even when I, uh, write characters that don't look like me or, you know, say I have to put on a wig it's usually from an interaction that I've had with somebody um, and I, I just think it's it rings more true than inventing something out of nowhere I and mean, once you kind of get the DNA of the way that somebody speaks or way that they operate you can kind of extrapolate through there and put them in any situation and um, you can it feels more authentic 
What was your process from taking from you know taking small stories or sketch ideas into a longer story? Did you outline first? What did you do to sort of find that 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 whole journey you were looking for? Yeah. So sometimes I would just write scenes that came to mind. Um, I can I can I one of the scenes I just remembered this recently used to be the opening scene of the movie when the movie was going to take place over a year in Austin was Emily going back to Austin because she lost her job in L.A. and was applying uh, for a job on Craigslist at, for a dog walker position and halfway through the conversation she realizes the guy who's been asking her questions has just been masturbating. And basically I wrote that because that actually happened to me and so the process is like doing, doing realistic sort of things that happen but then trying to figure out how that sort of fits into a narrative. And so the first draft that I actually had finished of the movie had so many disparate scenes that sort of took her on a journey and but when people read it, like, yeah, a lot of things are happening, but it's not quite a movie. And so from there, it it came down to okay, so I have this, I have this outline of a film. I I have her going somewhere emotionally. What is the thing that'll take her there uh, organically in a smaller way um, that I can basically pull off? And that became the idea of Mr. Roosevelt. That, Mr. Yeah. Roosevelt and the yeah. ex-boyfriend and, yeah. And, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. So now you finish writing the script and you're going to direct it. What made you choose? I mean, a lot of people would say this makes it harder for you. I'm not sure if it did as a director, but the film is shot in beautiful 16 millimeter. Like it, as a film fan, it just looks incredible. Um, what made you go with that? I have been, uh, when I went to film school in Austin, um, everything had moved over digitally and everything that I shot looked terrible. And so I thought I couldn't be a director and I sort of like, shifted my focus over to animation and editing. And then one summer I got a 35 millimeter point and shoot camera and took 36 rolls of film, couldn't afford to get any of it developed. And when I eventually was able to, it basically was this revelation of, oh no, not only is film just automatically, just has so much more texture. It, crisp. It's crisp, but it captures light in a way that digital can't. It has this great uh, range in tonality. But um, I was able to, because I wasn't looking over my shoulder at everything that I was doing every step of the way, I basically was able to develop my instincts and my eye. And um, I think that was the moment I was like, oh, I can be a director. So when it came down to uh, whether or not we're going to shoot this on digitally or on film, um, I always wanted to shoot my first film on 16 millimeter. Um, but that's a hard thing to convince people that don't trust you or don't know you to agree to let you do. But my uh, DP was a really big fan of it because she had seen my photography. Um, and I made the case that so many indie films are shot on the same digital cameras now. Yep. Especially at a certain budget level, they all look very similar. And I think the 16 millimeter really reflects the scrappy nature of the entire film, the character. It's rough around the edges, um, but has a lot going for it. And I just, I just feel like it matched the movie and the script. It's a, it's an odd thing to distinguish, but there's something about film that just looks more like a movie. And I'm not sure if we, it's because we grew up that way, and my eyes are trained that. But most stuff that you see, especially in the indie budget level that is shot on digital, there's something about it that doesn't even feel homemade in a good way. <laughs> yeah, know? it's a little it's hard. Yeah. There's a harshness to it. It's just, it's very, I mean, it's zeros and ones. So it's not real. It's not tangible. Um, it's not particularly atmospheric. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it's just there. And if you want to make it atmospheric, you can play around with lenses. You can uh, do things in post. Um, you could try and do things in front of the camera, too, that will help it feel a little bit more real. But film just, it's just a little, it has this romantic like, you know, yeah, and it's, it feels like being in the womb or something, because we did grow up watching movies on film, and so you see that, and it just has, like, a familiar lilt to it. And everything is digital now, so if I'm watching a movie that is digital, I might have also been seeing an ad on my phone that was digital, or something else that is digital, whereas if you put this on, it doesn't look the same as everything else that we're kind yeah. of constantly being pumped into our brains. Yeah, there's just, it just feels, I mean, what I liked about, what I like about film and why I wanted, also another reason, is just that, there's just room for error that then can sort of serve the film. Um, I don't know, just, I like the spontaneity of it and the grain and I like the mistakes and I don't know. What was the toughest part about uh, making the film? Um, I think it's just a very long road. I think uh, some of the toughest parts have just actually just been the, pers you know, once you are done shooting the film and you're even editing the film, then you have to, I, I just had to learn a whole other set of skills as far as 
Um, communicating to people I've never had to communicate with before. There's the whole marketing side of it. Um, I just had to learn a whole lot of things to be able to take it even to uh, coming into theaters and getting it distributed. So the business side of things. Business, that's the way. To, I didn't even business. know the word. <laughs> the business side uh, is hard, and it's not the part that I thought I was signing up for, but it's definitely an important part of the whole process. You know, I think I'm making my my movie, and it's going to be... Uh, this calling card for me as an artist, and then it turns out movies are a business, and I've <laughs> learned that. <laughs> and, yeah, that's something that I think, uh, like Paul Thomas Anderson said in the '90s after his first movie, was that he learned that six, 60 percent of his job is actually making the movie. Yeah. And yeah, there's 40 percent of stuff he had no idea about. Yeah, and, and yeah. Don't quote me on that. The percentages <laughs> might have been different. I read that in high school. Yeah, but um, I I would agree with him. <laughs> What was it? And that was the most difficult part was sort of finding, like, understanding that. The business of it, yeah. And then also, I mean, just stepping into a leadership position um, as a, um, as me was, um, it it was presented its level of challenges, but. Um, Are you not naturally like a a, a I, leader? I am very definitely definitely naturally um, like to take control of situations. Yeah. Uh, I think having that many people I've never worked with before and not really knowing, because um, I had a production company come on board. Usually all my projects were self-funded. And so I felt a little bit more comfortable asking for what I needed when it's my, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. But when a whole other team of people come in, I'm not really sure at what, I, at what level I get to be the boss. And it turns out I am the boss. And um, I just had to l learn to navigate that. But that, that was that learning curve. Um, I've, I, I get it now. Like when a crew member says, well, we can't do that. And you're like, how do I address that? I think well, we my can. Yeah, exactly. It, that happened so much where I was like, OK, then I would just go do it myself. And then people would get mad at me. Yep. And I'm like, but you said you couldn't. But I know I could. So yeah, and that's just that's not good business. We're not gonna we're not gonna have time to set it up. But we have I built the day so that we had. Why don't we have time now? Yeah, yeah. There's just a lot of like we can't afford that. And I was like, how much is it? And they're like ten dollars. And I'm like, we, I can afford that. And it's like my film. I'm gonna do what I need to do to make this work. You know, that, those sorts of things. How do you direct yourself on camera? Do you have some like do you you work with your DP to trust your performance a little bit, or yeah. do you sort of naturally know that you're getting what you need? Um, yeah. So she was definitely the person that was catching anything that I wasn't aware of. Um, I'm really hard on myself, and so I oftentimes don't think that I got it. I want to do it even, uh, I want to keep going, and there are times where people are like, no, Noelle, you, ha you do have it, you can move on. Whereas it's easier for me to see with other people because I'm directing them. Um, but <laughs> because it was shot on film and it was an indie film, oftentimes we'd only have two takes, time for two takes on me anyway, so it's just like, did we get it? And it's like, yeah, we got it. And so the, I really had no choice but to move on. But yeah, she was, she um, had my back the whole time. And especially because we weren't, we didn't, we had video playback, but it was on this little video tap that was very small. So we weren't really, we were never really consulting unless we were concerned about whether something was like off camera or um, we were catching something that we didn't want to. How, how did you go about casting? How did you go about getting your cast and everything? Um, well, we held auditions for a lot of the smaller parts that were um, in Austin, so we cast a lot of local um, actors, and um, some people I had actually written into the script, this character, Trin, uh, or actually her name's Stacy, but it's played by this um, my friend Trin, who I went to college with, and she's one of the funniest people I've ever met, and so I just wrote her into the script, but she had to audition for herself to prove that she could play herself, um, and she got the part, which is great. Um, and then the main actors, um, it was just, it's an interesting, I offered the part to most of the people. Um, there were people that I had seen doing, uh, I had seen in Los Angeles for a long time, um, but most of them had also been making their own content. Um, and uploading it to YouTube for years, and that's m more of where I've gotten a good impression of them is that that they were also self-generating artists. And why was that important for you to have actors that are self-generating artists? Because I think jumping into somebody's first feature film and really trusting them, you you kind of have to understand what that means and what that take. Like, do you know? Want to help? Uh, well, I wanted you have to have people that trust that you actually movies are made by people and it's yeah. not this magical thing. Uh, I, I wanted them, it's good that they understand what it's like to be behind the camera too, um, so that, because it was such a low budget movie, 
I think other people might, they'd be like, well, where's my trailer? <laughs> they, they were like, well, oh, it's cool. We'll just, we'll just sit in this corner and don't worry about us. So, a support system, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, they know what it really takes to make a movie at this budget level. And, um, and not only that, they, they were more, yeah, they were very creative. And they brought a lot to their characters. And they worked with me um, in a creative way, um, whereas just actors might have, I don't know, leaned on me in a heavier sense. You know, it's interesting, going back to the 16 millimeter thing for just a second, that it takes place in Austin and it's in 16 millimeter, because I don't know if it's because of the film, but it feels like you've very much captured Austin, and I think that may simply be because I think of Austin through Slacker, Richard Linklater's 16 millimeter movie, or like other films that have been shot on 16 millimeter in and around Austin throughout the 90s and the 2000s. I did not set out to sit, to like be like, this is my authentic take on Austin. It was... Uh, I had a lot of more scenes actually in the film that didn't make it in that were commenting on how Austin had changed and there's a lot of there's a lot more things that were happening in Austin and we had to cut it down to be more about the characters. Well, you get that a little bit with the, um, the, the the current girlfriend who's developed like a social media platform and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and so I, my big surprise is that people think it feels like an authentic Austin movie and that makes me very happy. All I ever set out to do was to try and portray things honestly like how I've experienced them. And um, part of what's great about the, the time constraint uh, of making an indie film and it being on 16 millimeter is that you're just really capturing what's happening and I, it, that's what I was going after. So um, I think it just is just naturally what Austin's like and I was never forcing it in one direction or the other. How difficult was it for you? I mean, coming from a comedy background, obviously you did SNL for a little bit, working with comedy writers and also working with comedians in other places, how difficult is it for you to write a screenplay and to, and to, and to shoot it, one that is both kind of funny but also emotional and like yeah. a real journey and not go for the joke as much as possible. You know, that's gonna I, be like a tough thing to pull back. I'm not that funny of a comedian, so it wasn't too hard for me. I, I, um, and also I, I found when I moved, when I went into the comedy world, there's such an emphasis on a joke that I felt like oftentimes it doesn't make any sense why we're, we're uh, there's just a lot of like improving, riffing and, and scenes that take things out of what would be realistic or what would be in the realm of what a character would say. I don't really like watching co uh, comedies where the characters are as smart as a stand-up comedian. Like that doesn't make sense to me and so to me, I never wanted Emily to be like the most amazing comedian in the world is razzing everybody because that's not realistic. Like um, it would, that would take her years to be that way. And then I'm not writing a movie about a successful comedian. I'm writing a, a movie about somebody who's struggling. And so- um, It comes about men like that a lot. Well, right? yeah, they like, want to like self-aggrandize. The, the comedies with the, like the lonely man who's sitting there like kind of mocking everybody. And, is, <laughs> and you're like, you're not better than anybody at this. You're just a yeah. guy with a slight wit. Yeah, um, and the, we actually had more of that from Emily where she was sort of uh, being very bitterly commenting at, at people under her breath um, because I kind of wanted to capture that version of a com comedic person. Um, Some of that is there, but there's an element of insecurity. There's a lot more insecurity yeah. and her place in the world is a lot more shaky than I think we normally see. Yeah. Yeah. So we just, we, we cut it back because it, we wanted to have a more of a nuanced performance where, you know, and part of the reason why she's so crabby is because she's an incredibly insecure human being. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you learn, kind of learn over the course of the film, too, that these aren't, there's no reason for her to be treating these people this way. They're not bad people yeah, yeah. at yeah. all. I find this, this is just, I think, a maturity thing. But everybody, I mean, at a certain age, when the world's not working out the way that you think it should be working out for you, the wonderful, marvelous, smart person you are, you tend to blame everybody else. And if anybody has a sunny disposition or things are going well for them, you think that they're... Rube. Fuck you. Yeah. yeah, you think that they're rubes. You think that they're idiots. You think that they don't truly understand what it's like to be a smart, intelligent person and they're, you know, and they're, they're in your way to get to the top when really everybody's just doing the best that they can and um, I don't know. <laughs> what was the, um, you know, you said that you pulled stuff back or you went in this yeah. direction. So I, that leads me to believe that there was a lot of post work where you were sort of like refiguring out your your story. What yeah. was that like for you? Um, well, some of it was necessarily because we just didn't get it the way that it needed to be for the story. Independent film. <laughs> yep. Uh, so there was a lot of things that's just like you go into post and you're like, oh, this entire scene just has to be gone <laughs> because we didn't really get it. And then you, you sort of shape it around there. And so then there's just a lot of 
doing test screenings, putting scenes in, taking them out, just trying to figure out the right order of the things that you have left over. And How did you handle your rough cut? In what sense? Uh, like a rough cut, some people are good at handling a rough cut. They can be like, okay, I know, that's great, it's fine, I know what I have to do, and oh, other people want to destroy everything and run away and hide. And, that was me, that yeah. was more me. I wanted to hide, but I really couldn't, because you have time. Money on the line. Yeah, time constraint, <laughs> even with editing, and so it was like every day I had to drag myself uh, to go look at the things, and um, yeah, no, uh, I had to really face a lot of my avoidant tendencies. And <laughs> but then I guess now going through the process, I kind of see how, you know, you have an idea of how the film, is, uh, you think the film is going to be, you think the movie is going to be this big grand thing. It's going to accomplish all these things that you had in your head. Um, and then when you go into the edit, you realize you've fallen short of so many of your ideas. But then as you start pushing through, it turns out you have everything that you've always ever needed to make the movie that it was always going to be. Mm -hmm. So while it might not have been as Very big. Very zen approach. I mean, it kind of feels that way where I'm like, okay, I, I get it. Like to other people, they're gonna see my mistakes and think that I failed in a, in a weird way. I see it as all just sort of a part of the process. The film is what it is. It exists how it is because that was what it was always going to be. And I'm happy with that and I can leave it be and learn from that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the film is good. <laughs> it's, so that, you know. it's really good. It's funny. It's enjoyable. A lot of people like it. You might not, but uh, if you don't, I don't care. I didn't <laughs> There's wanna, nothing I could do about it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to lead you down that path. No, no, no. <laughs> but I, but I, it's just I think people think like I'm very self-congratulatory. Like oh, I like made a movie. I was like, no, I made a movie. I, but I'm a, I do care about the things that I did wrong and the things that I, you know, you know what I mean. I'm like I want to make more. This is I'm not doing this for like a vanity thing. I like I want to make movies and I so I'm really happy and I'm very proud of it did you ever feel like anybody thought you were doing this as like a yes. vanity thing oh my god it was so ridiculous and it was just such it was so weird but then I like you're like I mean you're you're like you're like a, a somewhat well-known actress but it's not like you have enough clout to like burn something for a vanity project I know it was very <laughs> weird um and it was always really shocking to me when it came down to that where when I I recognized like oh you're talking to me like this because you think I'm I'm actually stupid not you know what I mean and um, yeah, that was always very interesting, and I always uh, took um, the fact that, because I know who I am, and I know why I'm doing it, but you fail to realize, like, people project onto you the things that they want to. You've also been doing this for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's been the desire, and it's taken me a long time to get all the tools to be able to do this. So, yes, I've been trying to write this. You know, I started writing this seven years ago, but I wasn't capable of making a movie seven years ago. And then if I tried to, it would have been really bad and probably very embarrassing. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk about some of uh, some of your other projects just yeah. a little bit before we get to audience questions. Uh, you had a wonderful role on Master of None. Yeah. Uh, we got to see you return in the last uh, episode. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like working on that? And what did you think of the return, the, the, the run-in? Um, well, I loved working on the show. It actually gave me, um, it was very collaborative and I really was able to shape uh, the character of Rachel and that actually gave me the confidence to finish writing my script. Wow. Because we would do rehearsals and um, we, I would improvise for this character and then we would go and transcribe it and then we'd look at the script later and I'd be like, oh my God, that joke is so funny. Who wrote that for Rachel? And they were like, you said that. And I then realized, oh, if I actually talk out loud I'm, and transcribe, that's a really easy way for me to write characters. So then I just rolled that into the movie. Um, coming back for that. Um, so that's how you write now? Basically, you go I mean, in a room and talk out loud for big scenes, or like I'll take the role of like two characters and I sort of talk out loud. Yeah, um, I mean, you need I'll, another person there while you're doing it. Um, you when I have, I have a writing partner too. Sometimes that we work on projects together, and so whenever we're working together, he's actually just writing it all down while I'm saying it. But um, sometimes I record on my phone. Um, I, I send myself notes all day long of like things that came out of my mouth, and then one day I'll have to like you know go and organize everything. Um, so it's a combination of, uh, of saying it out loud and then actually sitting down and doing really tedious work. Uh, okay, let's get some questions from you guys. Who's the question? Hi. Hi. So as you were talking about Master of None and if you, as you mentioned SNL, is there a show that you would love to be on, like maybe your dream project or maybe write for or direct? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, um, well, oh gosh, I feel like I'm being put on the spot. I'm trying to think. I mean, I really... I really like drama. I like. I think drama and television right now is is um, really great. So I think I would really love to do a more dramatic television show. Um, um, but nothing particularly. I mean, I would. I would be very interested in directing. There's a lot of um, television shows that I'd be really interested in directing. But I feel like 
if I said it, it would be weird. I don't know. I feel like I'm jinxing myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you generally gravitate towards drama more so than comedy in what you watch and stuff? Yeah, when I watch, I don't watch comedy. It gets me in my head. It makes me feel very insecure and confused about my own voice. And so I basically, and no offense to anybody's comedic show, I just, it just makes me m like mad that I'm not doing more and then uh, confused about what's funny. So I just, I would prefer not to watch comedy. And then the drama stuff, oh, I love, yeah. Next question. Hi, um, so I know you said there, uh, you had specific moments that you, of your life that you put into the movie and, yeah. and then something you can uh, keep in. Uh, did you, are you now thinking of uh, like other stories where you can like uh, Verge? either, yeah, add yeah, yeah. in those moments? Yeah, so I, the reason why I started with this film is because I didn't know how it would get made and I knew this script I could make no matter what, whether or not it was gonna just be um, a 5D camera, you know, uh, like a little digital camera that I was taking around. Um, so yeah, the goal is to make do lots of genres of film. Uh, now that I've proven that I can direct something that's a little closer to the vest, I can uh, take a lot more creative li license and invent uh, different stories and people that don't look like me and uh, <laughs> their lives aren't similar to mine, yeah. Do you feel like you've gotten this character out of you? Yes, <laughs> this character's not only out of me, I think I relived her through the process. So she's, she's dead and buried, like this is her good luck to you, lady. <laughs> did you have trouble sometimes? Like, did you ever find yourself over her in the middle of the process as well and have trouble sort of like sticking with her no. or going back or revising or re-editing or anything? So no, like, no, I actually, uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed working with her. I did, I, um, and I also enjoyed finding like the fun, the, one of the more fun things is when we were digging through an edit, uh, trying to see if there's anything else we can put in the film, little ad-libbed lines that I came up with that weren't in the script, just like sort of finding a little treasure and being like, oh, this is so great and so in character and being able to seed it into the film. So um, she, uh, she, she was, yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just devolved there. I was like, yeah, she's fun. She was fun to work with, but I'm done with her. Uh, one more. Hi, Noel. Hi. Um, so you moved to LA in 2010, mm -hmm. and you've been saying that you've kept writing this movie since college. And yeah. people underestimate how much goes into like a low-budget film and how much work you put in. So when it did get really hard, like, did you ever feel like wh how did you motivate yourself or your team to stay with the project and to really finish it? Yeah, um, I think because it was produced. I mean just the business side of it, you have to finish it. So as far as how to get sued. Yeah, yeah um, I, I couldn't be, you know, I couldn't really pull an Emily and like sort of bail on it. Um, uh, but I've wanted to give up so many, so much, like even like a week ago, I don't know, I'm, it's hard. There's no magic answer. It's just, you kind of have to keep just picking yourself back up, especially if this is what you want to do. And then I, all, all I'll say is like externally to people, they think they're like, oh, you've done it. You're, you're like, people keep asking me like you've made it or, or how, but I don't feel that way. And it's just always going to be a struggle. I think the idea is like, how can you make it more of a fun struggle? Do you know what I mean? Like if I'm failing, I don't know. There's something kind of fun about that too. <laughs> about failing? Yeah, yeah. It'll you give learn you, from it. You learn from it. Um, it makes you human. Um, uh, yeah, I would never want to be this person in like in a castle, just like everything's so easy. And um, but yeah, because it's not. That's I not would. reality. You would for a week. You're right. Well, um, for a week, but then people wouldn't want to be your friend. No, I hire them to be my friends. Right, fair. I mean, if people are making money, then... <laughs> and they have to pretend to be my friend all the time. Perfect. <laughs> uh, no, thanks so much for being here. Mr. Roosevelt, how can people see it? Is it in theaters right now? It's in theaters right now. It's at Sunshine Cinema um, here in New York. It's going to be... There's a website, mr-roosevelt.com, where we have more screenings. And then it'll be on VOD and Netflix uh, December 26th. Fantastic. Congratulations. Noah Wells, everybody. Let's hear Thank it. Thank you.